qualify that, we were the first ones with an approved liquor vendor. Um, one of the challenges we're going to talk about in this uh, and how we overcame that is one of the reasons we didn't actually sell it the first time. Okay, so enabling and maximizing, uh, I'll just make sure I've got the right one here, yes I do. Uh, we operate the Worcester Farmer's Market, we run between uh, two and three liquor samplers and, and uh, sellers every market on Sundays and we also do that on our Wednesday markets. Uh, we did this based on policy that was developed by the board that said that we're not going to impact uh, other vendors negatively and we also want to have to make sure we got our social conscience hat on. Uh, it's been very successful and uh, as you can see by the relationships that you develop with wineries, it's a great opportunity to help drive customers to your market. And really the biggest benefit of this thing is that it drives more customers to your market by increasing the market experience and rounding it out completely. So no longer are you just going to the market to get your food and your baked goods and, uh, and, and pick up a piece of jewelry for somebody that you think is special and you have to support the jeweler and not help them. Um, you are also able to grab your wine and it just about completes that European experience that we're talking about. Okay, so it's the full shopping experience and it works. Uh, what we're going to do today, what we're going to talk about, uh, a little bit of the history of sales at farmers markets, zoning, bylaws, permits, policy development and fee structures, insurance and liability, who can sell, vendor recruitment and retention, then we're going to be introducing a couple of gentlemen who are going to give you a little 10 minute, 12 minute verb of this through the eyes of a sampler and a seller, okay, because it's not just about us. We've got some opposing views on a couple of different things, but at the end of the day, it's important that you hear the, the view through the eyes of the vendor as well. So you have to understand them because they're going to be a partner of yours. So a brief history of what, how this all happened. Uh, there was a lot of consultation with the BC Association of Farmers Market with the provincial government and the Liquor License Distribution Branch, whatever they were calling themselves at that time. Uh, I sat on one of the committees uh, that participated in these consultations and uh, it was, it was far-reaching. They were very, very uh, engaging and going out to the markets and finding out what the concerns were going to be for them and they addressed those in the legislation. So uh, the enabling uh, legislation was passed officially in June of 2014 and uh, about 30 seconds after it was passed one of our vendors from the uh, Shram Distillery in Pemberton Valley pressed send on their application and they were the first liquor approved liquor sampler and seller at a farmer's market in British Columbia. And it was pretty awesome. They were very excited about this. The process worked and it was due to the consultation went through there. This is now a top-down thing. So what's happened is the provincial government has told farmer's markets they can do this. They've let vet, uh, vendors know. They didn't give them a lot of education on it. But they, and they sort of told the municipalities that this was happening. Not a lot of work done on with the, the municipal and on having them understand what was uh, business regulations, bylaws, that sort of thing, zoning that was involved in doing that. So we're going to get into that a little bit. Uh, zoning, bylaws, and permits. Top of this thing, and please let me know if I'm standing in your way. I'm sorry we didn't expand the whole thing, but it's just being weird. Uh, you do not require a liquor license. It is not your responsibility to get a liquor license. You are not becoming a licensed area. Okay. It is up to the vendor to procure the liquor license. Okay? What your issue is, first of all, you want to deal with your landlord. Okay? Some of you are in parks areas, some of you are in private land, some of you are in city owned land, some of you are just kind of whatever. You need to make sure that you, your landlord understands that you are now going to have this happening on your product. You need a letter of support from them because you're going to take it to the municipality when you go to make sure that you have the correct zoning. Okay, so Whistler Black Home Mountain, they own the strata that our market operates on. We had a letter of support from them. We went to municipal council. This all happened six months before the legislation even hit the floor for debate. So we were prepared for this. And at the end of the day, that was one of the things that allowed the legislation to go through, or for the municipality to go ahead and be prepared so that when this legislation did come through, that the zoning and the bylaw uh, pieces were dealt with, okay? Um, are there any questions on landlord issues that you think that might be more specific to that? Okay? Well, if your landlord is the city, 
Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. So then this is the thing, and this is where your relationships and understand. That's why municipal has a whole bunch of billets, and landlords have none. Your landlord's concerns are going to be that your insurance covers any issues that might happen from it. We're going to deal with that in the insurance slide, and that you are going to not just turn around and open up a beer garden on it. Right? Most landlords are in tune enough that they understand that. Municipally, is your market location zone for liquor sales? So, please do not go to the bylaw department and ask them this question. Okay, when you go to the bylaw department, the role of the bylaw department is to enforce the bylaws that are in place. So you want to go to your planning department, or better yet, if your municipality has somebody that's involved in economic development or diversification, talk to them. If they've got an EDO, talk to them. Also, get yourself a council person or mayor that is on your side. Okay, you want friends in this thing. They all come to your market, and the market is a wonderful thing. It's a vote-getting thing. They're all seen walking the market before the election, so make sure that they're there to support you for this. Find out if it does allow it, okay? Your planning department, or better yet, your EDO is going to be the person. But avoid the pain of getting shuffled back and forth between departments by going directly to the source, okay? Uh, they will then ratchet you up the chain, the food chain, and you'll be able to get in there without a big problem. So, once you have the answer to that, you want to find out, do your municipal bylaws allow for liquor sales in your market? Same thing, okay? Your, your EDO is your best contact with this. This is the person that understands what's going on, they're going to run point for you. If you go into planning, planning can look at the bylaws. It could be a business regulation bylaw. It could be a bylaw that prohibits the sale of liquor specifically in outdoor areas that are within a certain area of, uh, of the, the, the statue of the founder of the town area. Okay? Something could be there that's on the books. The planning department will find that for you, and they will be able to say to bylaw, okay, we're going to change this, or no, hey, you're good to go. All right? Questions so far? Who do you talk to within the municipality? Again, you want to make sure that you don't go to the bylaw. I don't like to say negative things, but their job, just as it is with the RCMP, is to enforce the laws that are on the books. The people that actually make those bylaws and, and get those business regulations, they're the planning staff. Okay? They're going to take care of that. Part. So you want to find somebody within your planning department or <coughs> your economic de uh, development officer. Presentation to mayor and council. You're going to start to bring uh, the dreaded sale of evil liquor and uh, all of the evils that go with it out into the public. And mayor and council may have one or two people that are opposed to this, and they want to be sure that you have the support of the community. So put together a presentation for mayor and council. For this, you want to have the support of the surrounding businesses. Okay? I've got a beer and wine store right next to the guy where Mark sets up what his booth when he's up there and he wrote a letter of support to Mayor and Council for the bylaw that had to be changed so that we could allow better business regulation bylaw. All right. Um, again, your councillors, your mayor, talk to them, create the dialogue, get it out there. Oh, we're anticipating this, this is great. The press love to get behind initiatives that are expanding the ability of, of, of good things, okay? So it's a good news story, so you can give them something there. Uh, and as I said again, letters of support from surrounding businesses, landlord, or stakeholders. Does anybody have any issues that they're dealing with right now with the uh, municipal bureaucracy that's not allowing them to do what they want to do and have the markets? Well, so I was going to ask you, like, they say, well, they don't have any bylaws because they've never had to do this before because right. we're actually going to have a public right on the street, and we can't have it in the schoolyard. That's even worse. Right. <laughs> so, so do you know some that we can just say, well, oh, actually, they've done it here. Just go and see what they have. You don't have to. Yeah, you can actually, uh, if you want, if you send me an email, um, I can copy the bylaw that they enacted for the business regulation bylaw that they enacted, and they can just copy and paste that. And they just run it through a business regulation bylaw. That's a really neat tool that municipalities have to be able to make specific zoning amendments for areas. Right? Um, the market that I'm involved with has problems because the city is just very worried about it for whatever reason. Yeah. They're hesitant and they said, well, we want to see what happens in other municipalities. So I guess I'm asking what's the best way of sharing our success stories and quotation marks 
Um, that's a good solid to this Yeah, okay, so what you can do is you can find out from the, uh, uh, if you go to BCFM, ask Georgia, after she's had a couple days off, yeah. to, uh, to get some information on the markets that did do the beer and wine sales, and then just contact them, ask them for the success stories. You can use our market manager um, forum that we've got going on uh, the Gmail group that we've got going. Is everybody a member of that? There's a Gmail market manager group that can post questions, get input from all sorts of managers on there. Do well with that one. And then also, again, look for stories in the press. If you send us, um, if you send me an email, I'll send you the press clipping from when we had it uh, opening unofficially at ours. So all good news stories that way. And that's the best way to deal with that. Okay, good. Let's carry on. Chris. Yes. I think uh, it's important to note this is maybe a bit of a worst case scenario too. For us, it was yes. a phone call to our rental department, uh, the city rental department, and uh, they made a change to our rental agreement, done. It was that simple. Yeah. So some may have to go through this step, others may just find it's a, it's a phone call away. Yeah, exactly. What we want to do is give you the, the biggest scope that we can of what you can run up against, and I'm taking all of the questions that were asked on that forum and I'm putting them in here as well, so we're trying to answer those. And in some cases, yeah, it's just that easy because the zoning is already the, the questions been answered, so you're good. Yeah. Um, our landlords and government are pretty long, yeah. yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah. So they're, um, they may have specific uses within their property that need to be addressed with that, but one example that I heard, and I can't remember exactly which market it was, but their market was in a government building, whether it was federal or provincial, and uh, they turned around and said, well, we can't have this because it's not allowed. And then they said, well, it's your government that said it shouldn't be allowed. So they just talked to them amongst their departments, right? And in that case, you want to find somebody probably on your, uh, your mayor, your council, or your planning department, your municipality that can help you sort of. We're in a legislative district. Uh, the yeah. city doesn't have much to do with it. Okay. I would just, uh, if you get in contact with, when you look at, we get to the application okay, here. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a, Number and I called these guys and they were amazing helping out with everything. <laughs> fee structure. This one is where there's a bit of different discussion going on. Uh, the fee structure need not be the same as other vendors. Okay. Um, depending on exactly how good you're feeling about it or how bad you're feeling about it, the fact of the matter is, is that it should be attractive enough to the vendor. However, it should acknowledge that the capacity of the vendor sales at your market. Okay. So if you're bringing 5,000 people and putting them in front of this vendor, they have an incredible opportunity for exposure and sale of their product, okay? This is relatively inexpensive compared to the cost of doing them at other venues and, and, and whatnot. So this is taking, for me, speaking with other producers that have come and set up in our market, they said when they did the numbers on it, it was cheaper than going doing at least another BC store. Just because of the way it worked out. So you're providing an access to that captive market that's ready to spend money on locally produced goods. You have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you have a choice. You can set up multiple uh, market day fee structures to create consistency. So when Mark and I sit down and we decide what market he's going to do, and instead of just doing a one-off of I want to promote my Wednesday market, so I want him to show up there as well. So I say, well, you do Sundays, it's going to be this, and Wednesdays is this. But if you do the combination, it's cheaper. Right? And the same thing for consistency throughout, right? I want a good partner who's going to be there and have a good product, but I also want to make sure that uh, we're, you know, we're receiving the, the benefit of it as well. Sorry, so were you implying to charge them much more than the regular vendor? I charge, them, I charge them $20 more than a regular vendor. $20. Which okay. is not much. So that's not yeah. it's not much. Nothing crazy. It's not <laughs> crazy. And are you collecting sales data on them? Is that extra? No. You don't know whether they're doing better than the other no. regular. I see the smile on their face when I walk by. The lineup outside of their booths, empty boxes. Empty boxes. <laughs> Ours are not but on a really good day, you know. Yeah. Options. So you're saying for a week you're charging $20 more than regular. Yeah. Yeah. So my, uh, just as an example, I'm not suggesting anybody does this, but the drop-in rate for me is $80 for a Sunday. Okay? So... Twenty dollars more, a hundred dollars. Way more BCAF and yeah. <laughs> so, they could probably charge more. Um, so those multiple uh, date structures to create consistency. This is an important point. Mark and I went over this presentation this morning over breakfast. 
2014 was the first year for liquor vendors to test the waters of farmers markets, and the financial benefits to them have become apparent. Okay, it, it is successful out there. They, just like you, are getting used to this thing. Right? I've got a meeting next week with the Worcester Brewery because they've had to go through a whole part. They've got to develop staff. They have to train staff that are going to go out there and be able to properly represent their property. Okay? It's very, very important to them. And uh, so it's kind of a, it's a learning thing. So you can have a good partnership, a good relationship with your, with your vendors that are going to be there and start out with five or six that you just rotate through. Right? and work them through and create a program that works well for everybody and at the end of the day you've got very happy vendors who are paying well to be there, who are receiving good sales and it's also creating more animation and draw to your market. Okay. Sorry, so how many at the market per time will you allow? Um, and I'll go through the how we got oh. there in our policy stuff, but we do two to three. Two to three. So, and one of the reasons we have the three out there is because one of our vendors, Shram Vodka, also is a, an artisan product vendor. They do lectures and that sort of thing. So they kind of, they're there anyway. So I just gave them that. Uh, and they waited for a long time. So any other questions on fee structures, considerations there? Yeah. Insurance and liability, you want to check with your landlord about their requirements, okay? Check what they need from you. Check with your insurer. Don't believe you have to go to $20 million in liability, but check with them to make sure that when you get, when I get Mark to name me as an also covered on his insurance, which I have to do for my landlord on my insurance, that that's the proper method of going around it, right? So we want to make sure that you're covered because your board has a fiduciary responsibility to your association and you don't want to be on the hook because your vendor turned around and got it somebody drunk and uh, sent them down the road, which isn't going to happen anyway. Well, we uh, checked with the cooperators last year, and yeah. then they said, like, as far as directors, it's all covered because the BCA and them have taken care of it. So we didn't worry about insurance. There you go. Just do so your... that should work for any member of the BCA. It should, should it? but always double check with your actual with your insurer and with your with your landlord as well. Just just cover these bases so that your landlord doesn't come back on you, and if something happens, they decide you're a small fish. You don't have a lot of money. <laughs> Excuse me, but your landlord. My landlord's got a couple hundred million dollar operation. So they're going to go after them, and I want to make sure that I'm protecting my landlord. So. <coughs> Excuse me. The vendor's responsibility. Slide over here for this one. The vendor assumes all liability for the sampling and sale of liquor. Ensure that you are named on their policy or right. Okay? Again, just get as many opinions as you can on this. This is the technical stuff that's going to make it painless for you to do this. The vendor is responsible for operating within the bounds of their license. So as soon as Mark has applied for and received his, his permit to operate, he is then given a 10 by 10, in my case, stall, and he can operate within that 10 by 10 space, and he has to operate within the terms of the license. If he doesn't operate within the terms of the license, Mark, what's the fine for serving a minor? 10,000 bucks. There you go, that's a lot of sales for one. He's not gonna do that, okay? And this is important information that you've got to be able to present to the people that you're trying to get approvals for if you're having issues. Say, hey, it's the vendors, they've got a big stake in this. They, the producers, are not going to risk their money, their investment by doing this wrong. They're not going to be um, Your responsibility. You want to ensure that the vendor's sampling within their licensed area and is acting within the, the accordance of their license. Now, this doesn't mean you're walking up to Mark going, you, is that 15 milliliters instead of 10? Right? <laughs> You don't have that power. You Only if I like you. Yes. <laughs> you shouldn't have that power. And it's really not something that you want to have to do. So what you want to do is make sure, Mark, you're not going out and sampling product in the middle of the market stroll. Okay? There's not a lineup of people behind the counter just drinking away out of the party. This is not a beer or a wine garden. Okay? It's for the sample and then the sale. They don't want to give it away anyways. Not saying that I haven't had a glass of wine, but just you want to make sure that they're operating within the bounds of their license. And if you see a problem with it, then your responsibility is just to say, hey, this isn't right, and our policy states you have to operate within the bounds of your license. And if you don't continue to operate that way, then we are going to ask you to leave. Simple. You do not have to do police ID checks, you do not require asserting your rights certificate, however, you should maintain the diligence of a reasonable person when it comes to looking after these things. And that's 
That's that term that's always out there in insurance and liability is the reasonable uh, person. Okay, you just want to do what, you, what a reasonable person would do. Pressing away. Who can sell? Okay, so, and who determines how far they have to be from the school area or another liquor vendor or any of those issues in there? It's the Liquor Control and Licensing Board that does all of these approvals. Okay, they are the ones who decide who can sell and the terms and conditions. Your applicant, the person who wants to sell at your farmer's market, has to go through the process of obtaining this authorization. They need to get from you your society number because you have to be a non-profit society in order to be there. You cannot be a for-profit organization for this legislation to work. Um, and you have to provide them with the hours of operation of your market. You do not have to say that you're definitely going to have them there for all those markets. They're just going to give them a blank approval for those markets, etc. And then they're going to go from there. The vendor has to apply for this license and provide it to you in addition to displaying it at their booth. Okay? It's just like when you have certified organic at your booth and your policies you have to have at your booth to show the certification. Well, the same thing with this. So liquor licenses have to be in plain view of the public and a, and a police officer or liquor inspector who goes by. Now, did we answer the question about the one kilometer issue? I know. Okay, so when the license is approved, it's approved by the provincial licensing agency, the Liquor License Control Board. They are the ones who look at any issues with whether it's within a kilometer of a school or anything like that. So you do not have to worry about that. Okay. And they don't care if it's within a kilometer of a liquor store. That they don't. I've got one 20 feet away from you. Yeah, we have yeah. one really close. Yeah. So, but that's why you want to have that discussion with, you know, your farmer's market is where your farmer's market is, right? So you're operating there independently. Okay? Do we have any other questions on this? The licensing? Vendor recruitment and retention. How do I find a vendor? Well, they find you. <laughs> they, some of them find us. They were there. I did a lot of cold calling a year before the legislation was even uh, brought into uh, effect. I was calling up Fort Barons, I was calling up my friends who were, uh, you know, winery reps. Mark found me, um, you know, just going out there, talking to people that you know, call up the wineries, just say, this is coming up, this is coming up, get that thing in it. They have got a lot of things that they have to do in order to make it work for them as well. So, it's, you give them as much lead time as you possibly can. Go to uh, wine tastings. Go to, go to a winemaker's there, check stuff out. Become part of the culture, understand it a little bit. And uh, when you can kind of develop that partnership with the, the winery or, the, or the, uh, the, the beer producer or the liquor producer, and there's 30 new breweries open up in this province this month. We just found this out on a Thursday. 30 new breweries open up. That's a lot of people out there that want to get their product out there. So visit other markets, okay? I'll go to a market if I'm in a town and I'll see a vendor that I like and if I think I can get them, I'll take them. Why wouldn't I do that with a, uh, with a liquor vendor? Okay, they're the people that are out there already doing it. So go out there and experience and work those connections, okay? And besides that, it's a fun way to do it. Because generally speaking, people that are involved in the liquor industry are fun people, right? They, they know what they do, they've got a lot of product to sell, they want to get in there, they want to set it up, they want to do it very, very well, and they're great to work with them. Cold calling your producers, know your numbers, know how many people come through it. If I go up to Mark and he says, well, hey, how many people are going to come through? How much wine should I bring? I remember the first time we had this conversation. We had it about four or five times, too, because he's good at what he does. He wants to know how much wine he should bring, right? So I know that on an average, you know, an average Sunday, I'm going to get between five and 7,000 people coming through my market. So you know what? It's going to happen. There. What's the demographic? What's the mix? What are other vendor sales? Well, my other vendor's sales aren't really going to impact his sales because this is a totally different product. But I can tell him that I've got a majority of my product, my customers are tourists who are walking through and the first thing they want to do is grab a nice BC bottle and put it out of it. And it sounds like I'm just, you know, promoting the wine side with that. We have beer and liquor uh, vendors as well. These guys were just chomping up a bit to be here. Know the number of uh, customers for markets, other vendor sales, and your customer demographics. 
Okay. Um, there's a big discussion on how you know we should track your vendor sales or not. Elizabeth wants us all to track our vendor sales. We don't do it. We think they'll lie to us. If it comes down to it, we'll do figure out a way to, to track it. But uh, that didn't wasn't really a, a mitigating factor for Mark. Now he may disagree when he gets up here. Well, I think to your point, I think being in the market, you have to build your own constituency. So you got to earn those sales. Yeah. So it's, uh, any other yeah. yeah. Like any other vendor, you know, you get applied, you apply, you've been approved. We're providing you with a space and a, mar and a, and a, and a, a, a market that is ready to purchase your products. They're coming there specifically for that. It's then up to them to do it, right? Does anybody have any interesting stories or questions about uh, finding vendors or recruiting them, retaining them? The retention part is uh, interesting because as you develop your relationship with your liquor producer and vendor, you can find ways to have cross promotions. So the other day I planted a seed in Mark's eye right ahead and I was like, hey, what do you think? Wednesdays I'd like to promote those. Maybe you could own those, right? Had the same discussion with the guy from Whistler Brewery. Right? Hey, what do you think about this? You know, you could, and then you get some uh, help with your advertising money. Do a little bit bigger promotion through your market. Uh, they promote it through their channels as well. These are all ways to maximize the benefits of enabling beer and wine and liquor sales at your market. Feature vendors in your ads. They have budget. Okay, so this is where we're going to have some different talks about this when the boys get up here. But there's a certain amount of budget that's in every bottle that gets sold for revenue. So if you develop a relationship and they're selling well, then there's an opportunity probably there to do a, hey, this week we're going to feature you, maybe we get a little help, whether it's wine, whether it's money, whatever it is, you guys figure that out. But encourage that, okay? Encourage food and liquor pairings with other market vendors. So one of the best shots, I couldn't find a picture of this one that was worthy of being in the presentation that we had from uh, when Mark was at the market was we put the cheese guy on one side and we put the chocolate guy on the other side. And he had red wine. It was a beautiful picture. And the reason I couldn't get a clear shot of his booth was because it was a lucky guy. <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, and where's that for your market experience? And that's just incredible, right? And nobody's getting hammered. Right? Create a mini beer wine spirits festival within your market. This one hasn't been done yet. There's a market that, uh, it's in the what's the one that, that's Oakland, that actually has a beer garden? That's not what I'm suggesting. Just create, uh, if you want to do a special promotion in the middle of the week, <coughs> or if you want to do it on what might be a slower market or a harvest market, have a, uh, uh, bring in a few more of the liquor vendors, have them do a sampling, but do it in uh, conjunction again with your food and uh, liquor pair. Sort of create a little mini festival like that. It's going to be something that adds animation to your market on the slower days, you know, on either end of your season if you have that. But it will also, and, and it, so it builds up those numbers as well, right? And it also just creates better relationships with your vendors that way. These are very, very, um, they're very energetic people liquor vendors and wine producers and beer producers. They want to be there, they want to get their product out. They're going to ask if they can sell t-shirts and all that stuff. You don't have to let them do that. Just remember, that's one of the things that they'll push on. Mark hasn't pushed on that. It doesn't have But you know, the beer guy's like, oh, well, I can sell t-shirts. I said, did you make Baker grow that t-shirt? No, you can't. Right. So that's just one of those things that you want to look at. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this through the eyes of a liquor vendor. Got Mark Simpson with me. Uh, he is the uh, the BC Wine Studios. His business uh, through that we have artisan wines. The wine that you tasted last night at the uh, the Grand Ball was the Sirens Call, and then we also have Julian Baker of Noble Beast, which you tasted as well. Mark was one of the first guys to come and get on me as a producer, coming to me as a market manager to be involved. So he's going to have his side of the story so you can understand that it's not all just about from the market side of it, there's from the vendor side of it as well. Uh, at some point in this we're going to click through, Mark's got a cool little video with you, and then we're going to go into the Q&A and we're just nailing this on time, we're going to have time for some really, really good questions in here. So first Mark. Come on Chris. Thank you. John. <coughs> Hi folks. 
Um, we've been listening closely to some of the questions, and by the time I'm finished speaking and by the time you've seen my video, I think you'll have some questions answered. But I'm here in, sort of in, in two parts. First of all is to uh, give the perspective of a vendor. I've worked really closely with Chris and have had a great experience at his market and others. I thought it would be interesting to come and share that. But I'm also here to meet new markets and find out best practices from what you folks are doing and expand my presence in farmers markets around the province. So that's sort of two parts. And I want to think, have you first of all think about wine as food. Um, it's grown up, growing up in BC, um, I've had a long involvement in the industry. I was chairman of the Craft Brewers Association of BC. I ran a brewery for 10 years. I'm also a brewmaster, so I share the beer perspective as well. And when I started, first started making and selling beer, we could not sell a glass of beer in our breweries, which is just crazy. So somewhere in the 80s, we formed the association. We lobbied, lobbied the British Columbia government. And they gave us something called a J license. There's A, B, C, D, E, F, J. I don't remember all those yeah. classes of license. Well, J license was a brewery sampling lounge license. So you could actually invite people to your brewery and sell them a glass of beer. Now, how civilized is that? Um, that took a lot of work. That was years and years and years of lobbying and pounding on government. So now, fast forward 15 or 20 years later, the climate's a lot different. Uh, the BC government, the, the Liberal government, I'm going to say thank you to them because they've actually had a fairly forward-looking view of liquor policy. They've gone through a liquor review. They've enacted a whole bunch of stuff. And basically, what I, how I view it as a producer is they're getting out of the way. They're creating a safe environment for the sale and consumption of liquor. They're also letting people who are entrepreneurs and producing economic value in the province do what they love, do it well, and do it responsibly. So for me, the overwhelming experience in being at farmers markets is I haven't seen one drunk person. I haven't been, had one person I've had to cut off. I haven't had to refuse service to more than 10 people, only because I thought they were too young and I didn't want to go to jail. <laughs> so basically, nobody's, nothing bad has happened. I've gone to these markets, I've met a lot of great people, made a lot of people happy, sold quite a bit of wine, and made some tremendous relationships with the, the, the people at the market, and that includes the other vendors, the people that come to them, and, and the, I guess my overwhelming impression of farmers markets is what a great uh, networking opportunity, what a great way to meet farmers, butchers, bakers, chocolate makers, mushroom growers, and all the people that buy that stuff. So really think of it as a tremendous marketing cubicle for all the things that we do. My other aspect I want to share with you guys is I found approaching farmers markets as a vendor that it's a very regional mindset in the sense that most markets want to have a small area where they work and the values of that area are expressed um, in how market vendors are recruited and retained. And I think that's good and valuable, but I want to also introduce the perspective that really we're all selling BC. We're all selling our natural beauty of our province. And I opened up my Facebook page yesterday and I saw pictures of people golfing and, and said, ha ha Toronto, and it's <laughs> snowstorms out there. So we're in Lotus Land. So this is the Lotus Land Farmers Market Society. So we, I really want to encourage you all to think about all us coming from the same place. We're all farming the same dirt. We're all breathing the same air. And the way our economy is, is structured and the way the mountains and the lakes and the rivers and the oceans work, not all things grow in all places. There are no vineyards in Whistler. There's no orchards, you know, in Quenelle. I mean, things grow in different places, and I think it's incumbent on us to share the wealth of our livestock, our wine, our beer, our food, in all the places where people would buy them and enjoy them. And that, and I'm asking you as farmers market people selecting vendors to think of that perspective and weigh it equally with the regional aspect of making sure that you're growing within that spot and so on. Because that's going to ultimately create more traffic for your market, create more consumer interest. And at the end of the end of the day, the people that come are going to enjoy coming there because they've seen things they like and they enjoy. And they aren't so much worried as where they're from. What they are worried about more is what's the integrity of the product. Is it made locally? Is it grown locally? And most importantly, is it sold by people who are passionate and believe in what they do? So um, I think that's kind of my experience so far. Now, uh, a few facts about the BC wine industry. Um, we have a $6.8 billion impact in Canada as a whole, and in BC alone, a $2 billion impact. That's a lot of jobs, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of bills paid, a lot of taxes paid. So we're, we form a very valuable part of the economy. There's um, um, $476 million in tourism value from the wine industry. And that's people not just buying wine, but going to tasting rooms, coming here on vacation, and so on. And the, the essential fabric of the BC experience is heli skiing, 
horseback riding, water sports, farmers markets, artisan craftspeople, uh, the arts community, theater, all those things woven in together, and they really can't be separated. So for you folks operating farmers markets, think about the aspect of that we're all on stage and we want to really sell BC as a province and a beautiful place to, to live and work. And, and this is really apparent to me as I go and sell wine overseas. I was in Korea last year. I'm going back with uh, Chris's friend Ben, who is now the special envoy for trade for BC government in Asia. And we're actively going out there and selling BC products in these other markets. And the reception that we get is wonderful food, great people, a natural place to live. So that's really what the experience I think that we're selling in farmers markets. In a one bottle of wine, one bottle of BC wine creates $43 of economic impact. And that's the, the glass, the grapes, the growers, the people that are hired. So I think if we bring uh, wine, beer, and spirits into the farmers markets, you're just going to multiply that economic impact. And in very specific terms, I think that allowing uh, us to come to your markets will grow your constituency. I can guarantee you more people will come to any market that I go in because I'm tweeting, I'm on Facebook, and I have 2,000 people on my mailing list that I'm going to invite, and they're going to know about it. So I think that's an important aspect to consider. And when we start talking about recruiting vendors, I guess my, my, my message I want to bring is don't just pick people with the biggest budget or the big corporations or the people that test you the most. Pick people who are committed vendors. And I think from my perspective being an owner-operator, um, I'm going to bring a lot of risk management to the table. If I serve a miner, I'm going to get a $10,000 fine. Not me, not my company, not someone else. I'm going to have to write that check. Also, I really value the privilege of coming to a market, so I'm not going to do anything at all to jeopardize that. So that means very small sample sizes. It means I being people that I think is anywhere close to under 30, looking people in the eye and making sure that, I, that I'm actually selling them a food experience, not just giving them a controlled substance. And you measure that every interaction. And, you know, I, I've just found it overwhelmingly positive, the reaction I get from people, the enjoyment, the smiles on the faces, and, you know, my booth's lined up 5, 10 deep sometimes. <coughs> the and that, to me, is very satisfying. A, because I'm selling some wine, which is how I make a living, but B, because we're making people happy, and we're creating a unique customer experience that's going to draw people to your to the market. So, I mean, I, I think from a risk management perspective, the risk is very low if you take the steps that Chris has outlined, and remember that when a winery comes to the market, the legal construct is that that is an extension of their tasting room. So my retail store is now in that 10-foot stall for a period of time. But really, I'm assuming the risk of anyone that would come to my winery, taste wine, drive home in the car, give it to their kids, all those other things. So we're going to be very, very careful about how we, how we, do, how we do that. And the way that I structure it in my mind that helps it be real is that wine is food. It's a beautiful thing that we farm comes from the same dirt, comes from the same air, and it's, it's part of the overall food chain of experience in farmers markets. People come, they buy their steak, their fish, their vegetables, um, they buy some nice ceramic bowls to put their food on, they buy nice hats that look good when they're driving home or riding on the bicycle. So really it's part of a holistic food experience. So really, we're just farmers with a different crop. And that's how I want you to view it, um, because that's my, my perspective on it. In particular, uh, uh, text of how I'm viewing this experience as my business. I had such a positive experience last year that I'm going to construct a good part of my 2015 marketing effort around the idea of buying local and shopping at farmers markets. So I'm going to be in a number of farmers markets around the province. I'm going to concentrate on Penticton, which is close to my winery, and Whistler, where I play a lot and I spend a lot of time, and in Vancouver, where I live. So I'm really constructing my own constituency in the places where I live and work, which is people I know I can retract staff that I trust, that are passionate about the product, that have been trained in how to express the wine as food vibe, and how to serve responsibly, and those kind of things, so make you go to sleep. And so the perspective I'm going to bring to your markets is someone who's really there to develop a long-term business, be safe, have a lot of fun, and bring a lot of passion. So that's kind of, kind of my thing. And I want to just set up the context for this uh, video. And the context of the video is this. Last summer, the city of Vancouver allowed a pilot program to allow farm uh, wine sales and farmers markets. Pilot program means we can stop it if we don't like it. And the city was very, very nervous. This is on the back of the previous year, a whole exercise in creating brewery sampling lounges. Whereas before, breweries could not operate like a bar, which means they could sell a glass of beer, some food, and 
uh, which was only under a tour and tasting construct. So the city of Vancouver created this whole legislative framework about brewery sampling lounges. And then when the farmer's market thing came along, the BC government didn't really explain it all that well, and they kind of left people like me to figure out the rules and make them up and understand how to manage risk and how to convince a market that it's okay to be there. So there was the risk of the trial not being allowed, so I decided to uh, go there and take some real life testimonials. So I went with my little high def video camera and I shot a few videos from the markets and these are real life customer experiences. And I, sh I gave this video to the city of Vancouver and uh, went, I remember this very clearly, I was at a, a banquet last year, I met one of the city councillors and he said, um, I'm not sure if we're gonna allow this. So I sent him the video and I said, I need to know who to vote for. Two days later, they allowed it. And now they're expanding to, I think, about eight markets. So they have three markets. I think there's going to be about eight this year. So for those of you who are nervous about it or not sure, I'm happy to meet one-on-one. -on -one. You can email and we can chat at the end. And I'll, I'll try and convince you that it's an acceptable risk and it's a great thing to do for your people because the people who come to your markets will enjoy it. All of this has to be done, though, with consideration of a policy of what your board of directors feels makes bringing liquor into your market and we'll just dumb it down to that, bringing liquor into your market to sales, how it works within their vision and within their values, okay? So before you do this, before you go out and bring these people into your markets, you need to create some policy. So you need to go out, and a good example of this, you can go and find policies from other markets who have already done it. Again, go on the forum. Uh, we're willing to share our policies on, uh, on the liquor distribution. One of the, some of the things we looked at was we did we ensured that we will have no more than three uh, vendors at any given market. And this is simply because we want to make sure that we're not negatively impacting potential sales for other vendors, as well as ensuring that this doesn't just become a beer festival. Okay? Um, the other, and I'll get your question when we get We also uh, make sure that uh, the part of our policy is we make sure that the uh, liquor vendors do not take the place of another vendor who adds value to the market being there. So if it comes down to, if we're at the two market, there's potential for a third, but the third space would be for a, a, a food producing vendor that I would want to have there, then we would make sure that that one would go to that food producing vendor. Okay, so our primary focus at our market is uh, facilitating and enabling the, the, the sale uh, and availability of regionally produced goods and services. Yeah, that's kind of what we, our overhaul motherhood statement is, and as long as it works within that, then we're, we're comfortable with that. And we just wanted to be very, very uh, cognizant of how the bringing these other vendors in, adding another product mix to the market would impact our vendors. The experience has been very positive so far, okay? But good policy. Make sure your policy is uh, consistent with your values and put it out there and let your be open and honest with your liquor vendors about it and how you're going to offer it. Okay? That will make it all work out very, very well. Any questions on policy pieces? Uh, oh, God, I just totally lost it. Um, that's what we're doing. We have a limited number. Yeah. Um, it's my understanding that. Uh, and I'm getting some pushback from our vendors who want to be there at APA every market, and I'm alternating them. Right. Um, it's my understanding that all the that in order to get a market authorization, you have to have a tasting room, and you also have to be growing some portion of the inputs. Am I right about that? Because he doesn't have a tasting room. I can speak to that. Yeah. The the, uh, the only wineries that are allowed to have the farmers market authorization are land-based wineries, which okay. means that somewhere we have a winery and a vineyard and we're farming 100% BC fruit. So there's no foreign wineries, like Chilean or American, allowed to be in the farmer's markets because that's the way the BC government has set up the policy. It's really uh, an initiative to help BC businesses be successful, yeah. and I think that's nothing to be ashamed of. It's, I think, the essence of farmer's markets, in fact. Yeah. And, and you need to have a tasting room endorsement on your winery license, which is relatively easy to get. If you're a winery without a separate tasting room, it's just, it's just a process where you set off a little area in your winery that has a tasting room and there's an inspector that comes and they look you in the eye and ask you if you are you know, responsible to use and how are you controlling sale to minors. And, you know, they're actually controlling it. They're making sure that people that get these 
endorsements are responsible and going to do a good job of it. Okay, so, so I understand that the, part, the inputs need to be from BC. I'm asking if you need to, as a land-based winery, do you have to grow a portion of that? Because we oh, don't yeah. allow our, our yeah. markets. All of no, yeah. I understand your question a little okay. better. There's no such thing as a virtual winery. You can't just start making wine and start selling wine as a BC winery. You have to have your own vineyard. There's a very rigorous application process to get a winery license, and you have to have 25% of your production um, from land to you farm. Okay. So in my case, I have about 18 acres that I farm. I oversee, I don't shovel myself. I have people that do that, because I'm busy making the wine, but I directly control the production of that acreage. And, and in my case, if you look in the back of my bottle, I name the vineyard and the grower on every varietal wine. That's how deep my connection is with my farmers and my grapes. And that's an essential part of my marketing effort is to have that direct connection to the dirt that I come from. And that's a really important part of the story. So yeah. I would suggest that's a good criteria in inviting your vendors is how serious are they about the thing? What's the passion do they bring? Do they have a credible uh, presence and story in your market? Okay. Because right. I have a distiller who's at my market who's making a product out of BC honey. They're not they don't they're not growing the honey, they're not making the honey, they're importing honey from all over BC and making so I'm confused about what well, the, the, here's the, the short answer to that one is is that your the, the liquor control and licensing branch are the ones who make the criteria ensuring that it comes from BC. Yeah. They don't ensure that it comes from your catchment area. Mm -hmm. That's your board policy. Yeah. That's your decision. Make it however you will. Consider all the factors we presented today. Yeah. But that part of the equation is taken out. They're not importing product from South of the border, Alberta, or anything like that. Right, to do so that. that I was just trying to clarify yeah. whether it was you had to, because you're telling me you have to have a percentage of actual product coming off your land go into the product. That is not true, obviously. For well, it's products. different for, for liquor and for beer. Yeah. Because, okay. right? Yeah. So, so it's a different thing. But the LCD, uh, LCLD, Does they're that the ones works. that take care of that part yeah. of The rest as of it's your policy. Yeah, yeah. 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 you're good to go. Yeah. So, go ahead. Oh, oh, uh, Alex, yeah. Uh, we, we've had uh, great success, like the, the people who wanted to sell, it's only wine so far. We're right there as soon as this went through the government. Yeah. And we were right there to take them, but it was our city. And we're still working on it. We did, at first they said, oh no, last you can't do because we have to have a public hearing and blah, 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 blah. And we thought it's not going to happen, but my daughter unfortunately talked to us about a pilot project. <laughs> so we actually had them there, everything went really well. And we're hoping that we get it organized with the city by April so we can start. They haven't yet. They won't give us a street permit until they think they anyway. Whatever. We'll work, we'll get it worked out. But I was gonna say that our policies, for instance, uh, for who gets to come, uh, right now as far as I know we have four wineries in our regional area, because we have our boundaries, um, and I think there's another one starting. But uh, that would be our policy. That they get to come. And only if there wasn't anybody in our area producing. It's the same as like blueberries. If, if we let people in from yeah. outside, because we don't have blueberries. But if we had a blueberry producer, that person wouldn't come if there was enough production to supply our customers. And we just do that with everything. So we don't allow any agricultural vendor or, or anybody from without, um, except if we don't have it. And, and we don't allow anybody other than our cultural vendors from outside area anyway, because we're a Yeah, and so, and then again, this is, this is where it comes to the policy and the values of your board. So what I would just like to say when it comes to the different liquor vendors that are available, and I'll just, that's going to encompass everybody, is that you have an opportunity to increase the animation and the number of guest visits to your market by allowing people from whether it's inside of your catchment area or outside of it to be there and provide a unique experience for them. So that's, you know, we take them from all over BC just because it's a unique experience. Yeah, because you don't have any within your area, but we are in I've, got, some, so I've, got, them, I've got them in my area too. Oh, but don't you get them priority? Well, they, they have priority, but they don't always want to be there the whole time. Yeah. And I don't say, I don't say just because you're from here, you trump them because they're going to come in. They don't always want to do all of them, right? Nobody yeah, gets yeah. in every market. 
That's our policy. Yeah. Because yeah. we're, we're trying to support local yeah. growers. That's yeah. what we're all about. Yeah, and again, that's your, your policy for your yeah. work. So um, I've just got to get on some other questions here. So one, two, three. Uh, we're from Kelowna, so yeah. we have a lot of wineries, and so now we have to make a policy about who we will allow to come. Like, yeah. like, we, like you said, not having too many so that it overtakes the market or whatever, but it's a difficult thing to make a decision on which ones we should allow, like limit to the number of uh, their growing area or, you know, how do we go about doing that? So when 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 we when we did this at our board, we looked at our values of our of our association. Okay. Okay. And so top of mind was to, you know looking at the social values, the impact on other vendors, and then when we if it's just a matter of determining well who gets to go and if they're all from our catchment area and that's your policy. Yeah. Well then at, at some point you want to be fair and say okay get kids here's what it is like with my musicians I've got musicians that want to play right. every single weekend right. and they're all from my area. But I put it out there and say, here's the dates that are available, what are the dates you can't work, okay, and then here's where you go. Unfortunately, you have to make a decision. Yeah. Nothing's easy about saying no to somebody, but at the same time, when, it, when you don't just give everybody everything they want, it makes them a little bit more hungry. <laughs> right? So, yeah. it's a tough decision sometimes. So, John? Um, I, yeah, I was just going to say, remember, I mean, the market is the one that is in control. I mean, you know, the winery, the beer, um, distiller, whatever, will have his authorization from the liquor board. I mean, after that, it's really how you run your policies. I mean, whether it's the catchment area, it's how you want to rotate, it's actually in the regulation in the, uh, the liquor branch that it says, you know, the market has the right to uh, rotate people, decide who is. Um, we invite the winery in. The winery doesn't say, I'm coming in. Right. We are the ones that have the, the, the onus is on us to negotiate, if you will, with the winery and say, you know, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Does this fit right. with our overall concept of what a winery, local, and, and all those other words should be? And then if they can manage to meet that, I mean, you know, it's up to you guys to be the control. Okay. You are in it. So, Kyle, and then. Uh, question about growling refills. I've heard. Uh, conflicting information. I've heard one market has had allowed gravel refills. I've heard from a brewer that said they were told by the liquor control board they may not fill growlers. Does anyone know? Uh, I do not have a definitive answer on that, but your, your, again, your producer is responsible for operating within the terms of their license. It's their responsibility, and if you want to get confirmation on that, ask your producer to show that they are permitted to do that. If it's a concern, the onus is on them. You got a lot of stuff to do running a farmer's market. You don't have to worry about all these other things. It's just a question that I'm getting from brewers before they're even buying. They want to know if they can do gallery refills, and I don't know the answer. They should ask. They should ask the. the yeah. They they need to do their work, their research as well. The liquor inspectors aren't totally up to date on sample sizes, at least on the island. Well, this is different um, than a sample size, though. This is actually well, cool. Yeah, I understand, I understand that, but they they come through and they've been unaware as. Oh, certain yeah. things as well, like yeah. even coming through the market. Can I ask yeah. that from a winemaker's perspective? Yeah. If I'm there pouring, and people bringing me containers, and I'm not sure if they're clean or not, and I have to pour them in a dodgy situation, the temperature control, I'm selling an inferior product. So I would think that the, that the product quality is really important. And, and the second part is, you know, having semi-filled open containers, risk management, you know, mm -hmm. I, just, I want to shy away from it. I think you want people bringing pre-packaged product. They want to bring 10 growlers with a seal on them, but you've got to think about food safety, you've got to think about responsible use, and, and, and filling bulk containers off the site with liquor, I don't know if that's, that's risky in my view. And I wouldn't do it as a brewer, because I wouldn't want someone having a flat, half-filled jug of beer. Yes, and the other there's perfect. an exchange of growlers. Yeah, but, and yeah. I believe that it's actually, if I think it back, I think that in the legislation it was packaged products, so that wouldn't yeah. be growlers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just go to the else. They, their responsibility is to find that out for you, right? Don't even make the decision yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't have that discussion. You don't have time for that crap. That's just my thing. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm Kathy from Terra, so yes. we don't have to deal with wineries, um, but, yeah. we do, but we do have um, somebody who's open a brewery. 
Yeah. And part of our decision making in allowing somebody in is the storefront sales. So we haven't really seriously discussed, um, but I, I believe this person is going to come to us. How can you defend, because he sells out of his brewery as well, yeah. right? So how can you argue in his defense to come in? Because I think that will be a reason for the board to say, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. So here's, here's my, my take on this. I've got, there's a market around town somewhere over there that has recently forced a couple of vendors to leave or phase out because they've determined after five or ten years of service that they now have a storefront when they didn't have a storefront before. They didn't consider it a storefront. And the issue with storefronts, the way that we deal with it in Whistler, is if you've got a storefront in Whistler Village, you don't have access. You can't come in, right? So uh, Mark James Breweries, who has the brew house, does not come and do beer sales at our store. But the brewery that's down in Function does have that. What you need to do also is to look at your policy and say, okay, is there a benefit for this coming here? The purpose of the storefront was really to stop people from having a, a big store, just turn around and come and get a cheap rent at a farmer's market, and it just becomes an open-air market. Mm -hmm. The street and sidewalks down. So well, you just have to go back and look up with your board and say, okay, in, is it consistent with our values to allow this brewery, who's a good part of our community, who's going to provide value to it, who's going to possibly benefit our market, to come in, and in this case, then we write, we change, you know, and say, okay, the board will accept this as part of our policy. It's not a bylaw. If it's not a bylaw, you don't have to wait to your AGM to do it. So just do it as a policy amendment, and then you're okay with it. That would be my defense. You know, if I was trying to get that brewer in, I would say they're going to provide uh, benefit to the market and that they're going to add animation, they're going to bring diversity, they're going to bring revenue, They're because you're going to charge them more, right, than the other vendor. They're going to bring... You know, and then once other vintners might come by and say, "Oh yeah, there's a there's a beer so Yeah, well maybe we should come up and do that. Maybe Mark's doing a trip to Terrace one time. We'll I'm, I'm actually really jealous that you guys have <laughs> such a dilemma as to who you choose for. for <laughs> yeah. It so, was so fun. And that's that's that, a good point of view to look at, there, yeah, isn't it? It right? was really fun yeah. at the Duncan Market to see all these. Um, yeah, like I say, it yeah. makes me kind of a little envious. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think yeah. that holistically, if if stuff. You know, we talked about this in the definition of farmers markets discussion here. Mm -hmm. If it's supportive of farming and farmers and supports the facilitation of the availability of farm products, then it's meeting the mandate. Then we just gotta step off our high horse and say, is it better overall for the market mm -hmm. to do it? Make a policy amendment, make it happen. Enable it. Uh, Dale from the Duck Farmers Market, what some of you may have seen yesterday when you came to our market was uh, we were basically in contravention of the uh, permission given to us by the city of Duncan, which stated that according to the Liquor Control Board license man uh, out of the Nanaimo office, who told the city planner uh, that we should all be in one particular area? We were, we were given a choice, the alley or the green door garden, which is a heritage building with an enclosed yard. We had them in there, um, and then it turned into mud because we're a year-round market. So we're now on the street in you know what we're trying to get to be a better mix. Um, but those particular wineries and one distiller are saying we feel ghettoized by being in a contained area. We pay the same membership fees and daily fees that the rest of the farm vendors do, and we deserve the same treatment. Yeah, short answer, the guy at the liquor, the liquor license office in Nanaimo is full of it. Okay, <laughs> the policy does not state in any, the, the legislation does not state that you have to put them off to the side or somewhere. It is up to the market to accept who they want, determine where they're going to sit, and just make sure it's run and it. That's never, it. And it never has been that. It never has been that. No, it's it's brand specifically new says location. But exactly. Yes. Well, no, the city, you know, if you're looking at a bylaw, then it's a business regulation bylaw for the city. So we, we talked about this earlier. No, it was a liquor license inspector. It was a liquor inspector that was telling me. Who told the planning department. Exactly. So the, and then you've got two bureaucrats who don't know what they're talking about. So then what you got to do is you got to get on the phone with the manager who handles this program to sign that warrant, to sign that permission, right? And he gets in touch with the liquor inspector and straightens him out. Okay, because there is nothing in that legislation that says you've got to put them off to the side or in one area. It doesn't exist.
from the city's point of view, the only, and we touched on this earlier in the presentation, from the city's point of view, the only thing that they have would be a business regulation bylaw or a zoning bylaw that would allow or not allow the sampling or sale of liquor in certain zones and areas. Okay, that's the city stuff. We talked about that earlier and how you can get through that process. But the liquor inspector, and they, you're right, Jim, they don't know. They're not up to speak, right? They don't. It's a very general directive. So I yeah. can see that it's short and there's not a ton of yeah. detail. But it's, here's a farmer's market. You can have liquor sampling and sales within the farmer's market area. And you can ask, if, if someone like me is coming to you, you can ask, because we've, you know, Mark's helped me a lot in here, but we, we try to know it because it's important. Oh, you know, I try to know it too. We try to know more than what the yeah. inspectors know. So when they show up, and they sometimes do, they, and then, you know, they show them the legislation. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's nothing in there, so it's good.